This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Yeah, I'm surprised too, because I've seen a lot of NordVPN ads just like you have, but I use it for something those other ads never discuss. But anyway, more about that later. I've lived in a lot of cities around the world, but the place I've lived in the longest, in my adult life at least, is Toronto. Or Toronto, as it's called by people who don't live there. Toronto is the best city in Canada. Toronto is one of the top three best cities in Canada. It's the capital of Ontario and the largest city in the country. Today, Toronto is a bustling metropolis with over 2.7 million people and an incredible skyline, including famous landmarks such as the CN Tower and the Sky Dome. And it somehow has one of the best public transit systems in North America, too. But jokes aside, the Toronto streetcar system does have the highest ridership of any light rail system on the continent. Toronto is a decent city, by North American standards, but it will never live up to its full potential because Toronto has a problem. It's addicted to cars. <laughs> Toronto was founded as York in the late 1700s and was designed to be the capital of the new province of Upper Canada. The city was later renamed to Toronto in 1834. Why'd they change it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. The city evolved like pretty much every city at the time, centered around industry on the water. As rail technology improved, the city was built out along streetcar lines, with the first streetcar being built in 1861. Many of these streetcar suburbs are still some of the best neighborhoods in the city, and I made an earlier video about the one that we lived in called Riverdale. The 1920s really were peak urban planning for most of North America. The first train station in Toronto opened in 1858 which eventually transitioned to the current Union Station in 1927. And it's been under construction ever since. The point here is that this city was not built for cars. That is, until after the 1940s when suburban development went crazy, which is the story of pretty much every city in North America. Just like in the US, the post-war period saw an explosion in car-dependent suburbs, the construction of massive freeways that cost nothing to use, and lots of other subsidies and incentives to get people into automobiles. This is where the addiction started. In order to make room for all those new cars, the streetcars had to go. Toronto has the largest historical streetcar network of any city in North America, but there were still lots of streetcar lines that were torn out despite public backlash. For example, there used to be a streetcar along Parliament Street that was torn out in 1966. And on Mount Pleasant, a 1976 poll conducted by the local business association showed that 88% of their respondents wanted to keep the streetcar line. So of course, that had to go too. The Toronto subway was also built shortly after the war, but one of the key motivations for creating it was a way to remove the streetcars to make more space for motor traffic. On the opening day of the Young Subway Line in 1954, the guy who was in charge of the TTC, the Toronto Transit Commission, was quoted as saying, The Queen Street Subway should be started at once, eliminating 80% of the remaining streetcar operation in the downtown area, and freeing many main streets for one-way traffic. With friends like that, transit riders didn't need enemies. Another Toronto Star article later that year read, the main purpose of that underground will be to lessen congestion on the streets. The subway can be justified as a central city traffic relief project. This makes it very clear that rapid transit in Toronto has never been for the convenience of the people who take transit. It has always been for the benefit of drivers right from the start. The regional GO train system was also built not as a project for people who live near transit, but as a train you had to drive to. And I made a previous video about that already. Speaking of driving, in the 1950s, several neighborhoods were bulldozed to build the Gardner Expressway, an urban highway right through the center of the city. For the other urban freeway, the Don Valley Parkway, traffic engineers didn't need to bulldoze many neighborhoods, but that's only because Hurricane Hazel took care of that for them in 1954. This reign of destruction to make the city car-friendly was really only stopped after significant public protest, which included that of famous author Jane Jacobs, who also fought urban freeway projects in New York as well. They successfully stopped the development of the Spadina Expressway, a project that would have absolutely destroyed the urban fabric of the city. 
Jacobs was quoted as saying, Toronto will commit suicide if it plunges the Spadina Expressway into its heart. Our planners are 19th century men with a naive faith in an obsolete technology. In an age of software, metro planners treat people like hardware. They haven't the faintest interest in the value of neighborhoods or community. Their failure to learn from the mistakes of American cities will be ours too. And that was 100% absolutely correct in every way. But while the destruction slowed, a lot of the damage had already been done. What was once a beautiful walkable city connected to streetcar suburbs had become a wasteland of office buildings and surface parking lots. But hey, it was easy to find parking, right? I'm old enough to remember the Toronto of the 1980s. It was a place you drove to, did what you needed to do, and drove home. And all of those post-war suburbs still exist today as a yellow belt of neighborhoods zoned exclusively for single-family housing. It kind of looks like a moat of piss that is drowning downtown Toronto. And it's why you so often see this ridiculous situation of single-family homes with giant condo towers in the background and nothing else in between. This terrible land use and a lack of investment in transit for transit users has resulted in the vast majority of Toronto and its suburbs being completely dependent on cars. And so, the busiest highway in North America isn't the Katy Freeway in Houston or any other place in the U.S. It's the 401 through Toronto. This is what it looks like at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday in the middle of summer. In other words, this is the best case scenario. But I'm sure one more lane will fix it. Canada was growing a lot in the post-war period due to an increase in immigration, and a lot of those new people ended up in the Toronto region. In particular, when there was uncertainty as a result of the Quebec sovereignty movement in the 1980s, many major corporations moved their offices from Montreal to Toronto. By the 1990s, Toronto was the largest economic force in the country and was urbanizing quickly, but this is when it gets political. Up until this time, Toronto was a pretty small city. It was just this part here, which today is called Old Toronto. Since 1953, the city did share some administration of regional planning with other nearby cities through a government structure called Metro Toronto, but otherwise, these were all independent cities with their own governments. This all changed when Ontario elected a progressive conservative government in 1995. The conservatives developed an amalgamation plan to combine Toronto with all its suburbs. This plan, which came to be known as the Megacity, I'm going to pretend that's how it was pronounced, was not popular. Referendums were held in all six municipalities, and in every single case, they voted overwhelmingly to remain as independent cities. So in 1998, the conservative government ignored all that pesky democracy crap and did it anyway. This was billed as a cost-cutting effort, but it was determined that over 70% of the expenses of the Toronto region were already being handled by Metro Toronto, so there was never much room for optimization. Though the plan did include taking a whole bunch of programs that were previously paid for by the province and downloading them to the city, which created massive budget problems that are still being felt today. But despite what was said publicly, it was widely speculated at the time that this had less to do with finances and everything to do with politics. As more jobs and influence moved to Toronto, it became the most important financial centre of the entire country. But of course, being a quickly urbanising city, it was mostly left-leaning, politically. The provincial conservative government didn't like the idea of a left-wing region having so much financial power, and so they forced the amalgamation of Toronto with its car-dependent suburbs, which were politically conservative, in order to take control of the region. And it worked. The balance of city council became increasingly conservative, but the worst outcome, by far, was the election of... Rob Ford. Ford was most famous for being a nutcase and smoking crack cocaine. Yes, I have smoked crack cocaine. But his wacky antics hid the fact that he was a terrible, terrible mayor. He admitted to being drunk at work and very often had literally no idea what was going on because he didn't bother doing his job. I'm just the asking you, we haven't even started the beginning of the Do you actually understand that it's grade separated, that it doesn't okay. rip out traffic lanes? Okay. It does rip out traffic lanes. It does. You know what, counselor? 
LRTs go down the middle of a road, they tear up your roads. No, you just, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, do you know about this specific route we're debating today? He tore up bike lanes and canceled transit projects, and he did a lot of this without the approval of city council. And every year we have dozens of people that get hit by cars or trucks. Well, no wonder. Roads are built for buses, cars, and trucks, not for people on bikes. And, you know, I feel my heart bleeds for him when I hear someone gets killed, but it's their own fault at the end of the day. Rob Ford repeatedly said that he saved the city over a billion dollars, which was a dubious claim to begin with. But after he was gone, the next mayor, well... We uncovered details of the decisions taken by prior administrations to rack up huge amounts of debt in an account called unfinanced capital. In essence, the city borrowed money without an identified means of repayment, and accordingly, those amounts of money were never added to the declared debt of the city. When I learned of this account, the total unfinanced capital, that means undeclared debt, had reached nearly $1 billion. This is what happens when you have someone incompetent running your city. But look at the map of his election victory. This was the suburbs politically dominating the will of Old Toronto, and the results were almost exactly along pre-amalgamation borders. Of course, this was likely the purpose of the megacity in the first place. In the early 2000s, Toronto was proposing widespread transit projects such as Transit City, a plan to crisscross the city with light rail lines. And they were slowly building out a network of bike lanes. Now, I'm not going to pretend that they were on the verge of becoming an urbanist utopia, but I lived there at the time, and the future was looking pretty good. But when the suburbs took political control, all of that disappeared. Now Toronto's future was being decided by the people who lived in 1960s-era car-dependent suburbia. The megacity set back the urbanization of Toronto by at least 20 years, and its effects are still being felt today. Rob Ford was an objectively terrible mayor, and he was an objectively terrible city council member before that. But because he advocated for more cars, he had the support of Toronto's suburbs. In other words, he fed the addiction. Rob Ford was forcibly removed as mayor and later died in 2016, but the Ford name has become a cult. Now Rob's brother is the Premier of Ontario. And he's brought in several pieces of legislation that seem to only exist to spite Toronto. It has become very clear that a vote for a conservative government in Canada is a vote against cities. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. Bike lanes, trams, city parks, and really just dedicating any of the land between buildings to anything other than car movement and car storage have become political issues. And by the way, don't bother complaining that you just want the urban planning without the politics, because urban planning is inherently political. Every decision from transportation to development to zoning goes through some kind of city council, and these are all political decisions. You literally cannot separate planning from politics. So you really, really, really need to vote in your municipal elections. I cannot stress this enough. Most races go to the incumbent, but sometimes a challenger is only a small number of votes behind, which means that the makeup of your city council is being determined by a handful of cranky old people. The topics I discuss on this channel aren't new to most urban planners. They know most of this stuff already. What's holding your city back is most likely the politicians, not the planners. Though traffic engineers do a good job of fucking things up too. Strong Towns has shown us that there is a strong fiscal conservative argument for more mixed-use walkable cities, that car infrastructure is fundamentally unsustainable and that it drives cities and suburbs to financial insolvency. But fiscal conservatism is dead anyway and replaced with populist culture war issues. It's time to stop the war on cars. Great podcast, by the way. I was featured in episode 74. Link in the description. Toronto has the potential to be a great city, maybe even the best city on the continent, but it's being held back by its addiction to cars and the politics that comes with it. Thankfully, there are several new projects, especially transit projects, on the verge of completion that may finally bring Toronto out of its outdated car-centric planning and into the 21st century. But I'm going to save those topics for a future video about how Toronto is currently suffering under its addiction to cars and how it might get back on its feet.
And I hope it does, because there's nothing worse than a city of wasted potential. Now, I travel a lot, and I get back to Canada at least once a year, which is good for keeping up to date on what's happening in Toronto. But when I'm traveling, I always end up running into a bunch of ridiculous technical issues that really shouldn't exist. What surprised me is that a bunch of these issues can be solved using NordVPN, which lets me choose where I want my location to be using an incredibly simple interface. One of the most frustrating things for me is how poorly many websites implement their login security. As soon as I load up my web browser while traveling, I'm inevitably met with security prompts and two-factor authentication. Connecting through NordVPN as if I'm at home usually avoids all this. I've also seen sites that default to the local language and currency with no way to change it. Why do they do this? But when this happens, I connect with NordVPN. Pro tip, if you want English and Euros, choose Ireland. Which reminds me, when I'm surfing from a connection in Europe, there's a bunch of American sites that won't even let me in. They don't want to implement proper data protection, so they just cut off all of Europe. So I quickly switch over to my connection to the US in NordVPN and problem solved. That same trick usually works for video streaming sites too, which I'm happy to do because region locking content is really obnoxious. I legitimately do not want to travel without a VPN anymore, which is why I'm happy to promote this deal with NordVPN. If you think this might work for you too, then you can sign up at nordvpn.com slash notjustbikes. And if you use the code notjustbikes at checkout, you can get a significant discount. And if you try it and you're not as happy as I am, well, then there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I'd also like to thank my supporters on Nebula and Patreon who pay me to lament lost streetcar lines. If you'd like to support the channel, visit nebula.tv slash notjustbikes or patreon.com slash notjustbikes.